<clears throat> Still loading. Okay. Okay, here we go. We're going live right now. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Parker. Uh, welcome to On the Virtual Road with the Rolling Res Arts. Um, I am the program manager of the Rolling Res Arts. Um, for those of you who don't know about the Rolling Res Art, it's um, a 32 foot retrofitted shuttle bus. Um, this thing is state of the art classroom, business training center, uh, mobile bank. Um, we work here in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Uh, First People's Fund's office is based in Rapid City, South Dakota. Um, First People's Fund, for those of you who don't know, is a native arts um, nonprofit organization. And we are dedicated to supporting native artists and culture bearers from all over the country. Um, we've got a very special guest for you this evening. Um, yeah, I'm just really excited about tonight. Uh, this guy here, this next artist that um, I'm about to hand it over to, uh, been following his work and, and, and he's actually a current uh, First People's Fund fellow and just, just really, really cool artist. So I'm gonna turn it over to him right now. Take it away, Taryn. Hello everyone, my name is Taryn Laskun. Uh, my Blackfoot name is Sahrina Mahka, which means Laskun. And I come from Amskampipikani, also known as the Blackfeet Nation in Montana. Uh, my hometown is Browning, Montana. And I consider myself a visual artist and printmaker, um, but I do work with painting, uh, photography, and then ledger art now. So today I really, I'm excited to share with you all uh, some of my process that the different steps I take when, when working with a ledger drawing and the different types of tools I use, um, colored pencils and all of that. So today or this evening, what I have with me is one piece here um, that I've started and then another piece that is almost finished here. These are two small sort of antique pieces of paper that I'm working with. The, lately I've been working with this small size, which is nine by four inches. And this one is just a black and white version um, of some colored versions I've done. I have a show up right now at the II Museum of Contemporary Native Arts. I have a solo show called uh, Color Play, and it's all ledger works. Um, and the reason why it's called Color Play is I've been exploring uh, certain color schemes, such as complementary, split complementary, and triad harmonies, and really been interested in how these colors uh, interact with each other. I've been, I've already been exploring this throughout my prints, and that's what I primarily do as a as an artist is create prints, uh, specifically screen prints. And I've really explored color um, a lot with that. And then on top of Blackfoot imagery, specifically our, our painted lodges, you know, I've done a lot of my own research. Um, I've always admired them growing up in my community and just learning the history of them, um, the, the meaning, the symbolism and the you know, families who own them and how some of them have even ended up in museums. And so a lot of my work reflects the painted lodge that is um, part of my culture, um, which is the Pekani nation, the Pekani tribe. Our traditional name is Pekani and our legal name is Blackfeet. And we're part of the six gates of the Biwa Blackfoot Confederacy, which also includes the Siksika, Kainai, and Pekani nations of Alberta, Canada. And so we all share, we all speak the same language, Blackfoot language, and we all share similar painted lodges and a, a basic structure to them. And I definitely feel 
I'm trying to add to some of that visual vocabulary that's been around for, um, I think, you know, centuries for sure, even thousands of years. A lot of my <clears throat> research does, does tend to go into more of um, even further back, you know, thousands of years with petroglyphs and pictographs and ancient art. And there's definitely a lot of that within Montana and Alberta. And so I feel very inspired by a lot of that old work. But so that's, you know, really what, who I am, where I'm from, some of the art I've been working in and a little bit behind, um, you know, some of my influences and inspiration. So right now with this piece, uh, this is an already done one. So you can see the line work is already done. Usually I'll fill it in with a uh, pencil and then go over it with line, um, the ink, pigment pens. And this is for this drawing down here, which I'm about to start. It, I'm gonna add the sort of the bottom um, concentric discs that you see here, this sort of balanced um, symmetrical piece of work that I've been working a lot with. Here's another one that's already drawn out. Um, with these images that are just sort of balanced within the, the piece of paper, that definitely the size of the paper guides um, my choice of composition. And these are definitely a little more abstract, <clears throat> still pulling from the kind of imagery, but uh, more thought-based. I use the discs a lot that to me symbolize um, Nathusi and the sun, Kukumikisum, the moon, and Ipisuwa's morning star. And for Blackfoot people, the sun and moon are a couple in their child, their son is morning star. And of course the sun and moon are, we know where those are, but for morning star, he is represented by Venus in the constellations of the planets. And I'm really fascinated by our sky stories as Blackfoot people. And we have a lot of sky cultural narratives that connect to certain planets and I've always been fascinated by that and trying to further my research into all of all of um, those old stories I guess and trying to uncover a lot of that so but let's get started on this piece down here So I really work in a grid-based way. That's why I have, um, or that's why I like to use these mat boards, cutting boards that have the lines that's nice and gridded out. So I'll place my paper within that, you know, um, not all the papers are perfectly even, like this one is, for instance, has another paper that was added onto it. And I try to use the paper, you know, if it was gifted, gifted to me, torn, then that's, I'll try to use it just like that. You know, I try, I try not to alter or tear down or cut the paper in any way, just use as is. And I think there's a really special quality and um, intimate feel with these, this old antique paper here. And it's, and how historically ledger drawing was a narrative way, you know, it was a form of sharing stories and and it was mainly done by Great Plains artists or even the Southern Plains artists who were imprisoned. And I really admire how you can see that in, in their various um, works. I haven't seen a whole ton of, or know about a whole ton of old, um, the early ledger artists besides one named Howling Wolf and Zotom. Southern Cheyenne and Kiowa, I believe. Um, I have a book that talks about their works and shows depictions and, but yeah, that's, it's really interesting to, to see what they were drawing before, which was ceremonial life, uh, imprisonment life, courtship, cooking. Um, so I really, I really admire and then it's changed over time, but I, 
I like how we've, how artists have used it to just express their everyday lives and really a, another view into that specific nation. So, and over time, you know, my work is very, it's still part of that thread, I feel like, and it's just modern in a more modern way, but still pulling from Blackfoot lodges and Pecani culture and our stories and our aesthetics, our geometric aesthetics. So, but what I like to do with this, I'll use this, which is nice and clear um, ruler. I, I have a ton of rulers that I work with and that's because of my printmaking practice. You know, I, I use the, this process, what you're seeing right here is very similar to my screen printing process and how I develop my images that then get exposed to screens. And so uh, it's a very similar um, lead up to that. But I like to use this clear one because it, it really allows me to line up with underneath and, you know, throughout the image. <clears throat> And I also like to create um, sort of these guides or stencils or this, yeah, just a guide that helps me place my circle where I want it specifically in the paper. And so I have a nice um, cross section. I even have the size of the circles I'm using in terms of the this little guide I have here with my stencil circles as well. So it just I, easier for me to know which one to use. But I can just line up with that cross. And then once I have it there, I can remove that, keep it held down, and um, just mark the sides. And then I plan on putting these two circles on the inside. I wanted them to be exactly, you know, perfect across from each other. So I'll put a tiny circle in the center of this shape I cut out. So that way I know where to um, later on to put my piece. And that just, this just really helps me to get a nice hand-drawn, um, you know, perf almost, almost perfect, you know, really clean look that I'm trying to achieve and then you know, I could definitely hand draw these circles, but it has a different feel to it. And so, and then this is still hand drawn, but you're being guided by a stencil and it just really um, stimulates my eyes. And I think it does the same for other viewers as well. And, or at least people who like my work, um, there's a certain visual quality or stimulation definitely that I'm trying to go for. And I have a bunch of these that I work with. Um, I work with the disc or circle shape a lot just because it's very universal and you'll see it a lot on our lodges. I mean, even just one disc symbolizes the sun and it's even on war shirts in the center and it, um, if it's at the bottom of the lodge, it symbolizes fallen stars or puffballs, which is this fungi that grows in high elevation spots. So I really, you know, that's just part of the 
learning about our lodges and the meaning behind them. And I feel they have so much to offer, um, offer us, even my own people, my, my own age from my community, uh, they have, there's just a lot to learn from them. And of course, protocols, cultural protocols, you can, you have to have the rights to paint lodges and to do all that. So I don't have the rights personally and I wouldn't feel comfortable painting a lodge if, if approached and asked, um, since I don't have those rights transferred to me. But I'm definitely aware of all of that, you know, within my culture and respect that. And that's, you know, those, anyone who has those rights, I definitely have a lot of respect for within my community. But, so now I know where to put my, my shape. I, I like to use micron pens. This is a number five. Um, I have, you know, various sizes, but I found that I like working with number five the most. Um, it's a nice line. And then I just, you know, I'm getting these three rings here. So this, these will be three colors. I've started it here. The outer color is going to be the, the big shape on the inside. So, and, you know, basically you just measure it up where it's center. And hold down firmly so that your stencil doesn't move. So now, and usually I'll mark my, my stencils here because some of them aren't cut the best and they'll leave a bump when you're doing a circle. So I'll put an X next to those ones that don't work and then I'll put a check by the ones that are like really good. And so I, I marked that little, um, circle there to help me. And I know um, a lot of people either use colored pencils or markers or even other graphite type pencils to do ledger. But I, I prefer using the colored pencils. Um, they have a really nice aesthetic. And my dad, um, Terrence Garter Pulaskan, he's a ledger artist. And so I grew up around it, but I never thought I would be doing ledger art actually. And so that's why I pursued printmaking. Um, when I attended the Institute of American Indian Arts. And so that's been my primary studio practice, which is not here in my home. It's actually using other studio spaces. But after the COVID-19 hit, um, that sort of eliminated that space I was working in. I really like these pencils because they have a really nice thin white eraser and it's perfect for prints when you're signing prints if you have a little scuff to get rid of it and then it's also perfect for this too to just get rid of these tiny pencil marks
and I usually take the tape, you know, I, I try to make sure it's not so sticky because it will rip the paper fibers. And I definitely am trying to avoid that. So, you can see now that I got it all in and then I would start to do the, the bread. And I try to save these just because they're nice and less tacky or sticky. And for the next paper piece, I'll just lay it down here on the, the grid. Oh, but um, this is one of my dad's works. And my dad really focuses on sort of our, our cultural warriors and historical figures. And I really, you can definitely see where I get inspiration from in terms of, this is our symbol for the Big Dipper, these seven circles. And then this is the sun disc. And then, you know, he has his split horn headdress on, on his horse with his coup stick. And, you know, after a eeny, a bison. So definitely, I really respect my dad's work for that quality of, you know, recording these people and recording our, you know, Blackfoot regalias and, and using our symbols that are part of our painted lodges. And so that, that really got me, started me into my own journey of um, just learning more about our painted lodges and what, what some of those symbols mean. So this is another um, a great book. This is one of my favorite books that I like to go back to and read. It's called Painted Teepees by Contemporary Plains Indian Artists. But what's, and it was actually um, curated by the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. And they did, it was all painted lodges from various Great Plains tribes, but a majority of the, the stories and images in here are of my tribe, specifically the Amskampi Pikani or the South Pikani in Browning, Montana, or just the Blackfeet Reservation, um, where, you know, there's a really great record of all types of stories in here. And then I believe it was, I don't want to mess it up. There's a bunch of artists in here though. And it was uh, Howard Pepian and Thomas Heavy Runner for my community. So, and I believe this is Victor Pepian though, who made these, all these lodges that were, that are, that have stories in, so I think it's just, a, uh, I just wanted to share that with people, you know, some of this too, Blackfeet Skies, you know, this is a teaching guide. And this is just stuff that really, I feel is important for me to research and, and I'm really interested in our sky stories and how it relates to us here on earth and how we relate to the universe, really how we're connected to the universe and it's, and how we've, um, a lot of this isn't taught. This wasn't taught in public schools where I'm from. And it's, and if it is, it's not heavily taught how it should be, you know, so, cause Christianity had, had a big influence on my nation and it, and, and it still does. And I think it's still important for us to um, look into these, and there are pockets on our, in our community with people who are really interested in this. And my late uncle, Daryl Ropes Kip, um, was one of the people who really was uh, trying to continue on our language, um, specifically about our culture and stories. And he was one of the co-founders of the Pagan Institute, which is a 
Blackfoot Language Research Center in Browning, Montana, my hometown. And it's still there now and I actually attended the, they have, they have an immersion school called Cutswood School, which is for younger students. And then, and when I attended, it was called the Lost Children's School. And that place really instilled in me my culture definitely affects my work today as an adult. And um, I'll always remember and cherish that. And I even had a class with him at the Blackfeet Community College um, called Blackfeet History. And, and just the Blackfeet Community College was another um, place that really instilled in me even more um, of my culture and history, the history, uh, historical side of our reservation. Um, so definitely have to give credit to both those places. I'm alumni from both of them and they still influence me today with my work. Um, now I'm gonna fill in this little one, which I almost have finished finished here. So it's just, a, I was working on it today and I accidentally went a little too far on it. Um, but I'm gonna fill in the rest. It's a, it's a black and white uh, ledger piece here. And this, you know, the stripes, I think, are very, in terms of art movements or that I, I would say I'm influenced by is um, op art and, you know, definitely for that optical illusion, the visual play you can create um, using specific colors. A lot of black and white can create that, um, you know, visual, it's like vibration between colors. So I'm really interested in, in finding those areas with when it comes to color. But others is pop art in terms of its color, um, again, the bright colors. And um, geometric abstraction, I definitely am a fan of more hard edge type works and, um, and simple, you know, simple works, minimalism, and just to, before I start that, um, you know, this is a, this is a great book right here. One of my favorites too, called Lanterns on the Plain, the Blackfeet Photographs, uh, photographs of Walter McClintock, who lived with us in the early 1900s, close to the late 18, I believe it was just the early 1900s. And he took, you know, over a few thousand photographs um, back then of my tribe and he captured a lot of our painted lodges then and you know you can see how a bunch of discs and very um, geometric and graphic and so that's how my work is a lot of artists from my community um, have graphic work and that's that's just our aesthetic as Pekani people, you know, we, we interpreted and viewed our world around us and, you know, really um, these bold, simple shapes that had so much layer, layers of meaning to them. And, and to create some of those discs, you know, they would use sinew and willow sticks for the triangles. Um, so it's really interesting to hear about the materials they would use as well. Um, but yeah, this is this. I just wanted to share one of the books that another great book of that I reference a lot. And then this last one, which is called the Blackfoot Papers, um, has a lot of great images. So I really like to collect any books on Blackfoot people and anything to do with our culture. And, you know, here's some more depictions of our works. So I, I definitely feel I'm trying to continue on some of that type of aesthetic and um, imagery and stories that are part of my culture that I've learned throughout my life, um, memories, and, and I'm, now I reside here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, so I'm for sure influenced by the, the landscape down here. Um, definitely my work is land-based land and sky-based. And, and there's 
these doorways. And so this is sort of like a doorway or it's a place, it's like a, you know, at the end of a trail and, or a trail that leads to a, you know, a spectacular view. Um, these doorways are sort of like that, that I think of them like that. And they're moments of opportunity or a new, new start or a new place. And, and sometimes they were depicted in Blackfoot um, imagery on our lodges. But I, I think of it more as for myself as an experience, a journey. I've been working with this rectangular um, shape for a bit now. And this is my first time doing it more so in stripes. Um, so I'm gonna add the black. I like to use Faber-Castell color pencils. They're polychromos and these are German made. Um, they're high quality colored pencils. And then the other one I prefer to use is called uh, Pablo and it, they're Swiss made. And they're both just high um, quality colored pencils that don't smear very much. Um, or I just be very careful, but they're really great color pencils to work with. And there's a great store that sells them here in town. So and my dad started me off with a, a small amount that I've just continued to um, add to over time. I have everything split. So I have my my warm colors and then I have all my cool colors and when I really like playing with the two mixing them to create that vibration um, I think that's definitely a another common theme in my work is sandwiching or working with both these warm and cool colors and of course very saturated very saturated colors and I'm trying to get a solid amount of, of color. So, okay, let's start this. <laughs> what I like to use too, I, I have this to just sort of help me um, not touch the paper as much or put my hand on it. Black is probably the hardest to work with just because it is so dark and can't easily smear. And just to get this all gritted out definitely took a while and just to try and keep a clean line, not go over, um, take some focus. But at the same time, it's very meditative. Um, you can do it anywhere. It's really nice. I think after I was unable to do printmaking 
screen printing at II, I definitely was trying to figure out what to do. What I know while I have those opportunities to be in a print studio, I try to use um, or just be very mindful of my time and consistent and work as much as possible since I know it's a limited uh, time frame. But after I, after we had to stay home, all the businesses closed down, including campus. I had these paper, this all this ledger paper for over a year, for some of it even a few years. And I just wasn't ready to do anything on them until this happened. So until with COVID. <laughs> And I had a solo show with with all this work in there too. I had two solo shows this year. One at Echo Mono Gallery here in town on Canyon Road. And one at the II uh, Museum of Contemporary Native Arts, Mokna Store Gallery, which is downtown. So, and that's the one that's currently up through um, November 1st. So, and it, the museum just opened recently. So uh, I know a lot of the museums in town were closed down, but now everything museums are allowed to open at 25% capacity. So I hope people are able to go see the show if they're here. And a lot of times before I um, start in terms of my color, choosing colors or, or even drawing on the paper, I, well, first, first I made this, which has all my colored pencil, um, well, not all of them, but most of my colored pencils on here. And I'm able to see at least what it looks like when it's a solid color. Um, that really helps. And then for my show that's currently up, you know, I like to create these sort of grids or not grids, but just guides, color scheme guides, um, seeing what works, what I don't like. And, but all of these, these were sort of inspired by, again, those color schemes, those uh, color, what is it? harmonious schemes and it's triad harmony split complementary or complementary colors um so i, I was really <clears throat> drawn to that along with you know the color wheel is a huge guide for me especially after i bought this um i just felt like i was able to control it even more so and yeah i'm definitely interested in knowing how to use color and its properties and really how to um, create that visual play and um, vibration. And so, you know, complementary is straight across or, you know, split complementary is this way. So there's this little guide here and you can switch it all up. This is, so it comes in handy for any artist, you know, should have this. And then I'll usually draw it out on you know colored pen or just pencil then lines and then fill it in on paper and these are really great for um for records just sketches of your art practice and keeping these as a sound to look back at 
it's really nice to be able to do that. And then I'll also work with um, this grid paper and draw it out. You know, I so I did various um, sizes that I was interested in playing with with this paper size. And so, you know, I obviously went with this one, but that really helps me to visualize what my work will potentially look like. And for my prints, this is very, um, very much part of my process when I'm trying to figure out a, a print as well. But I just wanted to share with you all more of the process in terms of how I'm able to visually see some of this work I'm working with. And I like to work in multiples or series. So these are like mini series. Um, this is the fifth one I've done like this. They all have their own titles. They're definitely their own works. Um, but I like working in that sort of a series type way. And that's only because of my printmaking background, working with additions and having multiples. Um, all of a sudden, I had this one of a kind and getting rid of or you know, if they ever sell or anything like that, then it's, it's just like, wow, it's gone. It's completely gone. No um, multiple to fall back to because I always save my number ones when it comes to my screen printing. If I do an addition of 20 or 10 or 15, I'll always keep number one. So I have this really nice um, archive, I guess. And so how I got away with that with Ledger. And I know a lot of Ledger artists work like that anyway, is sort of working with a sim a same similar image, but various color schemes and they all take on their own life. They're all originals and one of a kinds. And, um, and there's a lot of really great ledger artists out there too. So besides my dad, <laughs> uh, George Flett for sure, really inspired my dad. And um, I really admire George, George Flett's work as well. And then Avis Charlie, um, Lauren Goodday, um, Chris Pepin, those are all some of some art, some of artists you know who are working with Ledger as a medium, among other things. So, and I think it's great that. You know, ledger art for us indigenous people, specifically indigenous Americans, it's an art form that, you know, has a history, a legacy. And I think sometimes it's hard to think of movements within indigenous art sometimes, or it gets, you know, there's a whole traditional versus contemporary, but this is one that has lasted a long time and it's very nice to learn that history and know that I'm adding to something that has a really um, strong legacy. And I don't think, oh, sorry, uh, another ledger artist, John Isaiah Pepian, who also is a first um, People's Fund fellow. He, th those are various artists that are working with this now and that are doing really great work so
Hey, Taryn, it's Brian. Oh, yes. Hey, um, I really appreciate your process and, and how thoughtful you are in planning, you know, your art, each piece. Um, is, um, you know, creating your color scheme references and, and, and uh, the color wheel, is that something that you've, you've done from, from as early as you can remember? Or, or what point in time did you kind of decide that that's what you know you wanted to use as, as a tool as another tool to create your art yeah no um i think i've always been drawn to color growing up especially from powwows um i used to dance a lot chicken dance and definitely in the powwow realm we, you know it's all about colors and standing out and and that's where they use complementary colors a lot and so i definitely credit that growing up, you know, I, since I could walk, my mom and dad used to bring me to powwows and, um, and the beadwork, you know, all of that is really nice. And so that was part of it. And then also our, um, just the, our painted lodges and the colors that are mainly with that, which is primary, you know, yellow, red, blue, um, black, green was used and white. And, um, so I, try to work with those, but I'm really, I think it wasn't until II when I started doing printmaking in 2012. Um, and then I decided to add on an associates in studio arts and I focused with a focus in printmaking. Uh, that's where I really started to explore color as a student. And then after I graduated in 2016, I continued with printmaking and I think it was after I graduated that I really started to hone in on these really bright color schemes and using more, not the primary colors, but tertiary or, you know, secondary tertiary and um, mixing my own inks. I think that's what I really enjoy and miss right now in terms of screen printing is uh, mixing my own inks. I always carried my own bag of inks and once a color got low, I would add more to it and alter it slightly and working more in an, in an intuitive way in terms of choosing color. Um, but I, yeah, it was my, my solo show earlier this year was on paper bags. And if people go to my Instagram or my website, they can view them. But that's where I was really beginning to push some of these, these really cool color schemes and and really trying to put more research um, into color. I have a lot of different types of books that are focused on color and its properties and um, how color can interact with one another. And it was from those books that I was really picking up on the, uh, these, these color harmony schemes, of course, the properties on, on how to manipulate it and, and I know I was missing a color wheel. I was like, shoot, I need to get, and I've always seen these small ones at Artisan here in town. And I finally picked one up and it really helped me to um, control it way better. And uh, yeah, I think it totally made my color um, play more intense and more controlled and more, yeah, just, I guess more controlled is what I'm trying to, to go with. And it's, it's a great useful guide and I'm able to match up my color pencils with it. And um, working with color pencils has been really fun too, because I have, you know, a great, now over time, I've built up a great selection of colors to choose from. And, and yeah, it's just a lot of fun. It's, um, that's something that I've taken on on my own that I'm trying to incorporate with Blackfoot imagery and um, just any type of imagery I'm working with, which lately has gotten more geometric and, and minimal um, over time. I feel like my work has definitely gotten tighter and, and I'm not able to do really clean lines like this in screen printing sometimes. All right, you can, but, you know, I had, it's doing this 
um, hand drawing this, you know, is it's a, it was way better than I, I'm trying to think of how I can turn this into a screen print. Um, it's possible, but it's a whole different way of thinking and, um, you know, pursuing your, your final outcome of the work. But yeah, that's this, all of these really helped me out just having this as a guide to know like, yeah, this blue, this is what it looks like when it's really pressed down hard or if it's light shade um, or a lighter color of itself. Yeah, it really helped, helps out to, to draw it out on, on different paper first rather than um, rather than on your, your ledger paper, you know, so I have a smaller versions of and and they're great records uh, to have um, you know later that uh, that you can look back at back on as an artist and, and and improve you know choose pick and choose what worked what didn't work and so I just wanted to show this one this is actually a larger version of the small one I just finished and so this is definitely has that doorway or archway quality of uh, someplace else, this whole entirely different um, place, but that is full of energy. You know, I think my work is energy based. Color creates energy. And um, I've spoke with my partner about this and told her like how I'm trying to or I think of my work sometimes of how insects or birds see color and, you know, they're attracted to certain colors or they repel certain colors, you know, that's a bad, if they see this color, it's not a good place to check out. But for bees or um, flies that are attracted to a flower, you know, I think sometimes as humans, we can have a similar experience with an art piece where we're just drawn to it and captivated and, really brought in um and color has that has that effect it has that quality to to lure someone in <laughs> to to get closer i guess um and i really like when that happens i like seeing that myself i think you know i'm creating this work because i like it and i want to see it myself and um meeting people who who enjoy that you know is really nice too so but this is a piece too that one of my paintings, you know, definitely playing with color, complementary and shapes and um, trying to just stand out, I guess. But yeah, I, that's why, you know, I've, I recently just started working more with this color wheel. Just this year, actually, I got it. And, and that's how I was able to, if you guys see my ledger work, which is also on my website, um, there's, you'll see the, the color play, that's the title of the show, but you'll see the color interaction um, happening and see, see what I mean. But this one's all done. Uh, I mean, I could probably do a little bit more white. You can barely tell. It's trying to get a good turn angle, but the white barely shows up on the paper but it does if you know if you view these in person and this is a this is from 1896 um statement of account in case of error return this bill for correction paid october 19 or 1896 very fragile very thin i work with printmaking paper which is very thick uh this one is from miles city custard county state of montana uh, 1934 and it is a city clerk's record of official ballots so it's really you know this is a lot of this paper I'm using is from Montana my home state and so I think that's really great to be able to work with this paper from there and it's like your your image is once it's on this paper it, it really um activates the this antique historical piece of paper and I really 
like that about ledger art. And I, I have my degree, my BFA in museum studies, and you know, we I have a lot of I have a lot of experience working with art and seeing art. And so just being able to have something this old in your own hands, you know, as an artist at your home, it's it's really a special um, feeling. It definitely has that special feeling of this this antique paper. And and like I said, I, the images just sort of activate the, the paper even more. Um, and then this one too is from 1896. And I believe this one is from Montana too. So pretty old papers and you know, you can see the way the calligraphy, the way they were writing, um, you know, some stains that happened over time. It was checked off. So it's really cool to see this other layer of, uh, of, of your source paper of this account ledger paper. So I really like that about it. But yeah, I think that's, um, that's really what I wanted to show everyone today was finishing a small, these two smaller pieces and, and really showing people, you know, what I use a lot of this I've already had, like I said, because of printmaking. Um, and I just use a lot of uh, grid paper as well. So yeah, definitely. This really helps my process. And, and also cutting, cutting out the pieces so I can start to you know, start to play around with where it's gonna go, high, low, down. Um, yeah, those just really are helpful tips that I wanted to share with everyone, so. Thank you very much. Um, so I just wanna ask you one last thing uh, before we close out. Um, so, before you and I uh, uh, had talked about the possibility of you playing some background music while you while you work and demonstrate, and I just want to know, like, uh, um, so when the camera is not on you like it is now, and you're just jamming out and creating work, do, does the music uh, kind of affect the choices that you make and, and the designs and the colors uh, for the piece, or is that just already thought out before before you start jamming out? No, definitely. I feel like once I put my headphones on, I'm definitely in a more serious um, mood. I get. and and my music does affect my work. I, I mean, I listen to all types of music, but I'm really a, a fan of when I'm in the studio working like electronic music, um, synth wave. So it, it definitely had you know, and the albums all have retro real bright colors, uh, saturated colors. And, and then also like sort of rock slash electronic or electric um, type music. So for sure there's this, um, and I'm really drawn to, in terms of film, sci-fi, so there's this future quality to it. I think of it as like, how would people view my works, you know, way down the road, hundreds of years down the road. I mean, it would be if these even lasted that long, but, but yeah, the music for sure. Um, my music definitely influences my color choice and it probably is activating, you know, some neurological saying, use these bright colors <laughs> causes intense, like, I don't know, it, act, it stimulates the mind, so. Right on, man. Well, thank you. Uh, do you have anything else you want to share before we close it out or? Um, just if you're around Santa Fe, check out my show if you can before it closes. Um, if not, you can, you can view it on my website as well. 
or you know give me a follow on facebook i have a facebook artist page taryn last gun and also my instagram taryn last gun give me a follow on there and uh, you know my website you can check me out there and we, you know i have prints for sale on there definitely check out my work if you're interested in collecting anything it goes a long way supporting artists working living artists uh, especially indigenous artists and thank you first people's fun for you know the fellow being a fellow 2020 fellow it's um, helped out a lot having that grant to help me purchase more things I need to be a better artist um, artist entrepreneur and yeah I'm really grateful for for that and to be asked to do something like this I mean I know this is the new um, thing to, to do is sort of more virtual and I'm happy to have done something like this and share, you know, a little bit of who I am, my nation. Um, I have a lot of pride where I come from. I'm Scumpy Picani and um, yeah, I'm, I hope I can represent them well too and be a good ambassador that's, you know, away at this point but i definitely want to go home and um, do more there and yeah i feel i'm just learning a lot where i am right now and it's really good to the, for the stuff i have learned so far and um, for the opportunities i have gotten it's been really good and i'm really thankful for that you know especially during this um really difficult challenging time that we're all going through as a, as a nation, as a world, as a globe. So thank you, Brian, for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate you, um, uh, appreciate your time and appreciate you sharing your talents. Um, yeah, just can't thank you enough and, and have a good night, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, man, you too. Uh, I just wanna say thanks to everybody for uh, tuning in this evening for On the Virtual Road with the Rolling Res Arts. Um, Please continue to follow First People's Fun on, here on Facebook. Um, you can check out our website at www.firstpeoplesfun.org to find out more about upcoming events, um, find out more about our programs and the work we do, and, and just other good to know resources. Um, we have um, some classes uh, that we're gonna be, we're gonna have a, have a link up we're gonna be sharing soon. Um, for classes you can register um, with uh, one of our First People's Fund fellow artists, Cynthia Masterson. She's going to be doing a beadworking class. And then we'll be having a local artist here in, in uh, Pine Ridge, uh, Gene Swallow. He's going to be doing doll making uh, for beginners. So be sure to, uh, to check out those classes when they happen because it'll be a small registration, but um, we will be providing art kits for those who are registered. So we'll, we'll be mailing out the materials right to you if you get on the list. So be sure to, to check out that link um, when we share it. So uh, thank you so much, Taryn, for your time and, and your sharing your talents. And we just hope that everyone continues to take care of one another out there and, and, and support uh, indigenous art. So thanks again for tuning in and have a good night, everyone. Well, thank you. Have a good night.